So welcome everybody to today's Family Medicine Ground Round. Today is June 16th, um, 2021. And the event code today, if you need it for your CME credit is 167047. You can contact um, the CME office if you do have any questions, um, but the information is there. I'll also put in the chat box the link if we need that here in just a moment. But please make sure that you do claim your credit before midnight tonight in order to receive it. Next slide. So we wanna thank everybody as we get started here, please make sure that your microphone is muted. Um, please be engaged in the session. There are gonna be some polls coming up. So if you could please help us out in joining those. And also towards the end of the session, I'm gonna put in the evaluation link. We really need your help. That way we can give our presenters some feedback on her session today. Next slide. So this is the South Texas Regional Family Medicine Grand Rounds, and we are partnered with the South Central AHEC. Our mission statement is there for you. Next slide. If you do need help with your CME transcript, you are able to log in. Um, you can go to the CME website listed there, and you are able to view the sessions that you've attended. But if you do have any questions or if you see something missing, please contact their office. You're more than welcome to contact me as well. Next slide. Today's session is also one credit for AAFP members Are you, if you are interested. So please make sure that you do um, get that credit if you need it. Um, their information is listed there, but please feel free to contact me if you're having any issues with that. Next slide. And as far as today's conflict of interest, Dr. Torres and Dr. Davidson have no relevant financial interest with commercial interest to disclose. So today, um, the discussion is going to be on the DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 antagonists, the perfect pairing or better off alone. Um, today presenting for us is Dr. Erica Torres. She is a PGY-2 ambulatory care pharmacy resident and she is precepted by Dr. Davidson. So I will let her go ahead and get started for today. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, as Nicole mentioned, my name is uh, Erica Torres. I'm the current PGY2 ambulatory care pharmacy resident for the next few weeks anyway. And uh, today I'd like to share with you my presentation on DPP4 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists. Are they the perfect pairing or are they better off alone? Just to orient you to some of the stuff we're gonna be talking about today, first we'll describe the role of incretins in the pathophysiology of type two diabetes. We'll then review the pharmacology in place and therapy for DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists. And finally, we'll wrap it all up by formulating an evidence-based recommendation regarding the use of both incretin agents in the treatment of type two diabetes. And uh, just to let you guys know, y'all are welcome to, um, you know, interject with your questions as you like, whether you unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Uh, Nicole will let me know if anything pops up. So let's start off with a patient case. It's a Mario. So a lot of us might know Mario as the hero that saves Princess Peach from Bowser all the time. But unfortunately, Mario's put his heroic activities to the side during the COVID-19 pandemic. He figures P Princess Peach is probably safer, secluded in that castle by herself. So he comes to your clinic. He's got a past medical history of diabetes and hypertension. And he's noticed that because of his sedentary lifestyle, he's put on about 10 pounds of weight. He's also been trying to support local businesses by eating a lot of takeout during the pandemic, and he's got a newfound love for pineapple pizza. He says it's the perfect pairing. Add this to the extra pizza, and he's also noticed that his sugars have been running really high. So you work up Mario and get some labs, and you notice that his previously controlled A1C is now 8.1%. His current medication for diabetes is citagliptin metformin extended release and maximum doses. So considering Mario's case, 
How would you like to adjust his type 2 diabetes regimen? Would you prefer to A, start liraglutide 0.6 milligrams once daily and continue the citagliptin metformin, B, start liraglutide and stop the citagliptin metformin and start metformin by itself, or C, maybe you're a little bit more focused on the choice of food that Mario has and think that it's amazing, or D, pineapple pizza is appalling. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. And let me get let me know what you guys think. Also, let me know if the poll is picking up for you. Is everybody is anybody having is it popping up? It's popping up, Nicole, but it's got all the questions for the entire presentation. In there. Right. So, if, if we can. Yeah, so let's we'll just look at the first question. So if y'all could just answer to the question number one, uh, we'll just reset the poll and scroll down to the next question as appropriate. All right, starting to see a couple answers trickling in. I'll give you a few more moments. There are some answers in the chat box. I'll look for those too. Okay. I see there's a B um, and a C, B and C. All right. Okay, so we've got a pretty split room then. So uh, we're actually gonna come back to this um, in a little bit, but keep Mario in mind as we go through the rest of the presentation. Now I know it's another diabetes talk and I'm sure you've meant, went to plenty, but the thing is diabetes is such a huge important topic with millions of Americans living with diabetes. And if you look at this little map, you see this dark blue speck in the middle of Texas. And guess what? That's actually our Bear County, where 10.6% of people are affected by diabetes. There are a lot of things that go wrong in type 2 diabetes that leads to uh, persistent hyperglycemia. More than just these three things here, but I'll just break this down really quick. So we start off with some beta cell dysfunction, which basically means that our patients aren't releasing insulin like they used to. So this is already putting them at a disadvantage. Since they're not releasing as much insulin, even when their blood sugars are high. So they're staying high. Add this to the fact that people with type two diabetes are also insulin resistant. And that means that the little bit of insulin that they are producing, they're not even responding to like they used to. Top this off with a decreased incretin effect. And we've got the perfect recipe here for uh, persistent hyperglycemia and the complications that come with uncontrolled diabetes. But what are incretins anyway? Let's break them down a little bit. We've got two of them that occur naturally within us. There's glucagon-like peptide 1, aka GLP-1, and glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide, also known as GIP. Now, normally the incretins are released whenever we have a meal, whether it's pineapple pizza, cookies, apples, anything with some sugar in it will lead to the release of your incretins. Once the incretins are released, they send different signals throughout your body, leading to an increase in insulin secretion, um, reduction in food intakes, so now you're starting to feel full, as well as a slowing of gastric emptying in the case of GLP-1. You will notice that there are some subtle differences between the actions of GIP and GLP-1. And GLP-1 is most associated with that reduced gastric emptying, as well as that uh, increased feeling of satiety, as well as reduction in gluc glucagon secretion. These actions don't last forever though. Normally, the incretins are inactivated by DPP4, an enzyme within our body within minutes of secretion. There are some notable changes in patients who are affected with type 2 diabetes. 
not only do they have a blunted response to GLP-1, but they have virtually no response to GIP. So that means that they don't have that glucose-dependent insulin secretion. Because there's minimal response to GIP, from here on out, we'll focus in on GLP-1 in those modes of action. So before we get into the medications, let's start with a quick knowledge check. Which of the following is true regarding the incretin hormones? And this will be question number two on the poll. Is it A, both play a role in slowing gastric emptying, B, patients with type 2 diabetes have virtually no response to GLP-1, C, eating pineapple pizza would stimulate incretin release, or D, incretins are broken down by DPP-4 after two hours. I relaunched it, so it would be question number two, but if you're having trouble, if it's not going, you can, you can put your answer in the chat box as well. It's not even letting me pick one, so I don't think it's working. If anybody can answer, you can put your answer in the chat box. Sorry about that, guys. I see an answer for D. All right, I guess the polling probably isn't working as well as we thought, but um, I do have one answer here that's D. Does anybody have any other thoughts? All right, so for this knowledge check, the correct answer is actually C. So whether you like pineapple pizza or not, if you ingest it, this would stimulate your incretin release since that'll be a response to food entering the body. Um, the reason why D is not correct is because incretins are actually broken down within minutes, not hours. So now that we've gotten familiar with our incretins, let's talk a little bit about the pharmacological agents that uh, affect the incretin uh, system. So from here on out, we'll talk about these as incretin agents. And we'll start with DPP-4 inhibitors. These do basically what it sounds like they do. So by inhibiting the breakdown of your natural incretins, this leads to increased glucose dependent insulin secretion for a longer time, reduce glucagon secretion, and therefore reduce postprandial blood glucose. These agents are very well tolerated and have few contraindications, but you will have to uh, watch out for pancreatitis as this is a contraindication to DPP-4 inhibitor therapy. While side effects are really rare, what you may notice in patients is some nausea, diarrhea, nasopharyngitis, and joint pain. But these aren't really common at all. This slide here gives us an idea of all the uh, available DPP-4 inhibitors on the market, including citagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin, and alagliptin. And we can get to know them all as the glyptins. They're all conveniently available in a once daily oral tablet formulation, which helps with adherence. Unfortunately, DPP-4s do have two drawbacks that I'd wanna bring your attention to. One is the pricing. As we can see here, a 30-day cash price for these agents is around $500. Add that to the fact that the A1C lowering is very modest from between 05 to 0.8%, and it could be questionable that you're not getting the most bang for your buck by choosing these agents. And that's where GLP-1 agonists come to play. These are a little bit different from DPP-4 inhibitors in that they directly stimulate GLP-1 receptors. So you'll see a lot of the same um, actions as well as reduced gastric emptying and increased satiety. You'll also see um, much stronger actions of um, increased glucose-dependent insulin secretion. Unfortunately, 
Most of these agents are available just as subcutaneous injections, and there are a lot more warnings and contraindications to look out for. So patients with a history of pancreatitis, gastroparesis, and these two rare cancers would not be able to use these agents. Side effects are unfortunately also more common here, with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and constipation being the most common. The good news is that by starting patients on low doses and slowly titrating them, you can mitigate those side effects. There's a lot of different GLP-1 agonists on the market right now, and so I broke them down into the nutides and the glutides, and that's just because the agents here all end in nutide. Something common to the nutides is that they have a 50% similarity to human GLP-1. And what this means is that the body does have a chance of forming antibodies against the protein, which can attenuate the glycemic response. The nutides are not, unfortunately, an option in patients with severe renal impairment or dialysis. We see here that we've got some short-acting agents, exenatide and lixisenatide, which are dosed twice daily and once daily, respectively, as well as one weekly option in exenatide extended release. And you'll also see that the A1C lowering for those short-acting agents is much less than that weekly agent. So this is a quick thing to keep in your back pocket. Further acting agents reduce A1C less. Moving on along to the glutides, we see liraglutide, dilaglutide, semaglutide subcutaneous, as well as a once daily oral tablet. Uh, the glutides are a lot more similar to human GLP-1, so you don't see as much antibody production against them. And the other pro here is that they don't need to be renally adjusted though you might notice that your patients with renal impairment are a little more sensitive than you might expect. We've got two weekly options here in dulaglutide and semaglutide subcutaneous, and we also see impressive A1C lowering of around 1 to 1 1.8% at maximum. Unfortunately, these are also associated with a high price tag, though, costing about $1,000 a month. The redeeming factor, though, is that GLP-1 agonists come with a lot of different benefits, and they're actually one of my favorite um, medications to treat, treat type 2 diabetes. Not only can they all help to um, have our patients lose some weight, which is a struggle for a lot of our patients, but liraglutide, dilaglutide, and subcutaneous semaglutide have actually been associated with cardiovascular and renal benefits. So there's more than just blood sugar lowering that comes in handy with these. So now we've got another knowledge check. We've got AH, who's a 46-year-old male patient with type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. His most recent A1C is 8.0% despite adherence to linagliptin metformin for the past several months. Of note, his labs also reveal his EGFR has decreased to 55 mils per minute. Considering his comorbidities, which of the following medications would be the most beneficial for AH to reach his A1C goal of less than 7%? I have tried to redo this. So the polling is up again, and it's just got the one question at a time. So hopefully this works. I see some votes coming in now. Okay, excellent. I do have a question dark, The Dr. Nato has asked. Um, it says, I read that it is less clear that long-term outcomes are improved with the glyptins. What is your view of that? Uh, yes, that's an excellent question. So um, basically with the, when you think about the glyptins or the DPP-4 inhibitors, they're not necessarily associated with any cardiovascular renal benefits. Um, in fact, there are two agents, saxagliptin and alagliptin, that may be associated with um, worsening heart failure. So really with these agents, all that they have to offer when you think about them versus the GLP-1 agonists is just um, reductions in blood glucose. And really they're not very strong at doing that. Okay, so taking a look at the poll, it looks like we've got quite a few answers here. And um, it looks like 
the vast majority has voted for dulaglutide. And um, the others have voted for the other GLP-1 agonists I have on here. So in this particular case, dulaglutide is the best choice. And that's because, um, as we discussed on the previous slide, uh, dulaglutide is one of those agents that specifically is shown to have those renal benefits as well as cardiovascular, considering that this patient also has hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Um, the reason why exenatide and albiglutide aren't um, the best answers here is because those trials haven't shown benefits specifically um, in those patient populations. In addition, albiglutide's actually been discontinued off the market. It used to be known by Tansium. So now that we've kind of gotten familiar with our two incretin agents, could it be that GLP-1 agonists and DPP-4 inhibitors could be the perfect pairing? Let's think about it for a little bit. So we've got Mario eating his pineapple pizza, which leads to his endogenous GLP-1 release, which then floats away and goes to stimulate GLP-1 receptors in his body. While normally this is stopped by DPP-4, if he's got a DPP-4 inhibitor on board, which he did, instead of glyptin, this actually allows for his um, GLP-1 to hang out longer and continue to stimulate those receptors. So wouldn't it make sense then that if we added a GLP-1 agonist along, that we would get further GLP-1 receptor stimulation and thus further glucose-dependent insulin, um, insulin secretion? It's possible. Um, now, one thing to bring up is that GLP-1 agonists are resistant to DPP-4 breakdown, but it still can happen to a little effect. Well, not if we have a DPP-4 inhibitor on board to protect it. So thinking about all this, it's possible that these two agents can work together synergistically in theory. But what do our guidelines say about it? One thing that I can say that the ADA and the AACE guidelines do agree on is that GLP-1 agonists are highly favored due to those extra benefits that we talked about earlier, whereas DPP-4 inhibitors really are just um, a more modest um, diabetes medication and doesn't really have those other benefits going on for it. Now, as far as using both of them together, the ADA is very clear in their stance in which they do not recommend the combination. However, in the ACE ACE guidelines, they don't mention in their algorithms uh, either a stance for or against use of dual incretin therapy. So it's still a bit of a clinical gray area. And for that reason, we do still see them used together in practice. So that brings us to our clinical question. Is dual incretin therapy one, safe, and two, synergistic in the treatment of type 2 diabetes? I conducted a literature search of this question and found five studies that documented the use of dual incretin therapy. Some of these started, studies aren't the strongest, but this is the evidence that we have out there. And in the spirit of weird combinations that might actually be good, each study is represented by its own perfect pairing. So we'll start with the study by Violante and colleagues. This study looked at the switch to exenatide versus addition of exenatide to existing citagliptin therapy. This was a randomized multinational double-blind control trial, so our gold standard for evidence, that included adult patients with uncontrolled diabetes who were stable on both metformin and citagliptin therapy. Exclusions were mainly with contraindications to either DPP-4 or GLP-1 agonist therapy. The intervention arms were as such. We had the switch arm in which patients were discontinued off of their citagliptin and replaced with placebo, started on exenatide, the short-acting formulation of 10 micrograms twice daily, and maintained on their metformin. In the ad group, citagliptin therapy was maintained exenatide 10 micrograms twice daily was added, as well as metformin maintained. The primary outcome of this study was change in A1C from baseline to week 20 in a test for non-inferiority. Secondary outcomes included percents of patients with A1C less than seven and changes in fasting blood sugar and weight. Um, 
I've got a couple questions I just noticed in the chat. Sorry about that. Um, I did see here from um, Dr. Jane, the question is, why is the ADA against it? Dual encrypted therapy, that is. Um, so the reason that's cited in uh, the ADA guidelines is just that there's not sufficient evidence to support the use of these agents together, which um, makes a little bit of sense considering that whenever I did conduct this literature review, I did only find five studies, two of which were actually just case reports. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and delve into the evidence out there for it and see if maybe this is something that we can consider after all. And a uh, comment here from Dr. Nadeau, it is expensive and that is very true. We've got two medications that are pretty much brand only with the exception of alagliptin. So that can definitely uh, leave a dent in the patient's wallet. So let's go back then to the Violante study and see the baseline characteristics. What we see here is that at baseline, the patients were in their mid fifties, A1C is approaching eight and um, almost maxed out on their metformin doses. This gives us that primary outcome of the change in A1C throughout the study. The dotted line gives you the switch group, whereas the solid line gives you the add group. Um, there's little dots on the right-hand side, and this is representing a supporting intention to treat analysis to see if the difference was maintained. And as we can see from the separation of these lines, we did see a statistically significant difference in A1C lowering between the switch and the ad group, with the ad group having a higher A1C or a bigger A1C reduction of minus 0.68%. In the switch arm, the A1C lowering was minus 0.38%. So non-inferiority was not confirmed in this study. This gives you a picture of some of the other outcomes in the study. And we see that in the ad group, the group that had dual encrypted therapy, we saw a larger proportion of patients achieved an A1C of less than 7%. And this was the only group that had a reduction in fasting blood sugar. Moving on to the safety standpoint, the good news is that there were no significant difference between side effects of nausea, vomiting, and discontinuations due to side effects between the switch and the ad group, which implies that the um, dual incretin therapy was well tolerated. So what do we draw from Violante and colleagues? What we saw here in this trial was that switching from citagliptin to exenatide was not equivalent in A1C lowering compared to adding exenatide to citagliptin. A proposed reason for this difference is the fact that exenatide is a short duration of axon GLP-1 agonist. It's possible that with the twice daily doses and when you have your doses dipping off between, it's possible that the citagliptin helps to augment GLP-1 agonism in between those doses and thus led to that reduced A1C. I do have a we comment see that here. Sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah, go ahead. There was a comment here from Dr. Nato. It says statistically significant change agree. Do you think that 0.3% lowering of A1C is clinically significant? So that's an awesome question. And I was just about to get to that. So um, if I think about the A1C lowering that we see with different agents for diabetes, uh, even the modest A1C reduction lowering um, agents tend to reduce the A1C by something along the lines of 0 0.6, 0 0.8. So really, if I think about using two agents together versus just one of the agents, and all I see is a difference of 0.3%, personally, I'm not impressed by that. But the argument on the other hand is that maybe that 3% is all that patient needed to get to goal. So it's just something to keep in mind. So with this study, considering that it's um, you know, relatively small and it's just one study, future studies were needed to go ahead and assess DPP-4 inhibitors with longer acting GLP-1 agonists, especially since most of the agents that we use today are either weekly agents or have a full 24 hour duration of action. So considering what we saw in this past study, A1C lowering may be greater when which of the following GLP-1 agonists is combined with citagliptin. 
Do you feel that you could extrapolate the results of this study to lixisenatide, semaglutide, dulaglutide, or maybe now you just want to try french fries and ice cream? The poll should be launched for whoever would like to. It's anonymous, so no wrong answers. So we've got a pretty mixed room in the poll here. Um, so in this case, the best act, the best answer is actually lixisenatide. And that's because it's also a short acting GLP-1 agonist. With the Violante study, we looked at exenatide twice daily, which is also a short acting GLP-1 agonist. And so really we can't extrapolate just yet to these longer acting agents since we haven't studied it just yet. So then enter knocking colleagues. This was a very small study. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, this was a very small study that, sorry about that, looked at the comparison of um, addition of citagliptin to liraglutide versus placebo. This was a randomized double blind crossover clinical trial that included patients with type 2 diabetes on stable metformin and liraglutide therapy. This uh, study had two intervention groups, and they did have a crossover design, so I'll explain it. Basically, what happened was group one got citagliptin one-time dose, and group two had a placebo one-time dose. After that one-time dose, 60 minutes surpassed, and the patients were then given a standard mixed meal. This was, again, just a one-time dose. And during this study, the investigators measured the concentration of their blood glucose, insulin secretion, as well as uh, incretin secretion. After this one-time dose, it wasn't repeated. There was a three-day washout period in between, and the groups crossed over, effectively meaning that group one then got the placebo one-time dose, and then citagliptin got, and then group two got citagliptin one-time dose, and the whole thing repeated. The primary endpoint here was difference in incremental integrated postprandial glucose response, which is basically a fancy calculus way of saying difference in postprandial glucose with respect to time. Secondary outcomes included differences in glucose, insulin, glucagon, and incretin concentrations. Remember when I said this was a pretty small study? Well, it was a very tiny study. Only 13 patients were included here. Um, and they were about 55 years of age on maximized metformin dose and an A1C pretty close to goal at 7.5%. This gives us the primary and some secondary outcomes. So the chart on the left is actually the primary outcome, which is plasma glucose with respect to time. And the second one is insulin secretion with respect to time. The citagliptin group is represented by the black circle line and placebo by the white circles. The little small arrow on the left is when the dose of either citagliptin or placebo was given, and that longer line represents where the standard mixed mill was given. So you might notice it's a little bit hard to see that placebo line, and that's because there was actually no statistically significant difference in plasma glucose or insulin secretion with respect to time between the citagliptin and placebo group. Now this next slide though, to me is mechanistically interesting. This is actually showing our GLP-1 and GIP concentrations with respect to time. And what we see here is that there is a statistically significant difference between citagliptin and placebo. And so what this is showing is that citagliptin is working and doing its job by you know, inhibiting DPP-4 and thus raising incretin concentration. Unfortunately, it just didn't translate over to clinically meaningful outcomes here. But what we have to remember when we analyze what we see from this Nock and colleagues study is that they assessed only a single dose of citagliptin in just a handful of patients. So here, citagliptin and liraglutide together did increase incretin concentrations, but it didn't change insulin secretion or further reduce postprandial blood sugar. 
It's possible that the reason for this is that the citagliptin was actually added to stable liraglutide therapy. And it's possible that with liraglutide there at therapeutic doses, it can already be providing maximum GLP-1 receptor stimulation. And that means that even though citagliptin is raising GLP-1 concentrations, there's just nowhere for that extra GLP-1 to bind to and make an effect. Still, longer and larger studies are needed to confirm these results. So then we've got Lathian colleagues. Unfortunately, that's it for our randomized controlled trials, and we're moving into case series and case report um, areas. So with Lathian colleagues, they looked at adding weekly GLP-1 agonists to DPP-4 inhibitor existing therapy. So this is really good because weekly GLP-1 agonists are something that we very commonly use in clinical practice. Patients included in this case series were adults with diabetes who already are taking DPP-4 inhibitor therapy and that were then started on a once weekly GLP-1 agonist. These patients also had to have at least one A1C drawn within six months of starting dual incretin therapy. The population was divided up between group A and group B just based on whether the patients were on oral diabetes agents or insulin as well. And the endpoints looked at here were change in A1C and weight from baseline, and secondary outcomes were side effects and insulin initiation or changes. So this was a pretty small case series um, consisting of 18 patients who were about 50 years of age and had much higher baseline A1Cs compared to our randomized controlled trials. So this probably looks a lot more like our typical clinic patients with the A1C in the tens. The most commonly used um, DPP-4 inhibitor here was by far citagliptin. When we look at the GLP-1 agonist, though, we see that the majority of patients were on albiglutide or tansium, the one that I had mentioned earlier that had been discontinued. So that's just something to keep in mind when we look at the results of this study. Since tansium was discontinued due to um, suboptimal performance compared to other weekly GLP-1 agonists. So looking in at the primary endpoints of change in A1C and weight, we do see that patients in both groups did have a good A1C reduction of minus 0.8 to 0.9%. We only saw weight change in group A though, which makes sense because group B is the one that's on insulin and insulin has been associated with weight gain. Unfortunately, none of the patients in this case series achieved an A1C of less than 7%. But that makes sense with what we see here with a 0.9% max A1C lowering. Because remember, these guys started off at A1C 10, so they needed a lot more to get there. Um, we did see a significant amount of patients require a change to their insulin dose or initiation of insulin, but no patients discontinued therapy due to side effects, which is another supporting evidence that dual incretin therapy is well tolerated. So this is, while it was just a case series, it did give us a good assessment of dual incretin therapy over a three to six months duration in a real world setting. So it is still a valuable piece of the literature. While we did see an A1C lowering of 0.8% without any discontinuations, this um, A1C lowering is unfortunately not evident of a synergistic relationship. Really, this A1C lowering looks like it all just came from the GLP-1 agonist. We've also got a couple confounding factors in real world type settings, including other medication changes as well as um, adherence. So if a patient's not really taking the medication, it's not going to have any effect at all. So what we take away here is that dual incretin therapy offers little benefit, but also little harm in our patients. So now we're moving on to our last couple studies, and these are going to be quick case reports. Iyer and colleagues conducted a case report on a 76-year-old woman with a minimal past medical history. So her story all started in her primary care physician's office. She was on exenatide therapy, and because she needed further glycemic lowering, citagliptin was added on. By about day seven, the patient started experiencing uh, abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting that didn't get better. 
This unfortunately led to an eventual hospital admission for pancreatitis. The patient responded well to supportive therapy initially and was sent home, but then she came back to the hospital with worse symptoms and unfortunately um, did pass away. The autopsy showed necrotizing pancreatitis with full digestion of the pancreas. And in case you're wondering, that kind of looks like this. So there is a strong temporal relationship between the addition of citagliptin and the development of pancreatitis in this patient case, but this is just a one patient case. We need much more evidence before we show, before we can confidently say that dual incretin therapy further increases pancreatitis risk when compared to the two agents alone. Our last patient case here is by Patel and colleagues. And this tells the story of a 55-year-old woman who was newly diagnosed with diabetes and started on metformin, like a lot of our new diagnoses are. Unfortunately, this patient could not continue on metformin therapy due to severely elevated LFTs. She was then stopped on her metformin and instead started on citagliptin and glipizide. Three months later, when she came back, there really wasn't a big change to her A1C. And so the decision was made to start exenatide through the patient assistance program. So this was um, the patient assistance programs are great because that helps to also address any cost issues with, again, as we've mentioned before, very expensive agents. Fast forward seven months from the initiation of dual incretin therapy, and we see that the patient's A1C impressively lowered almost to goal at 7.4%. The patient also experienced an 11 pound weight loss and had no complaints of side effects whatsoever. So this story of dual incretin therapy had a much happier ending when compared to the Iyer and colleagues case. However, whenever we're talking about a case report, we can't really prove cause and effects just like with the negative case before. So do we really know that the 1.9% A1C reduction is due to the dual incretin therapy? Or is it due to something else like improved medication adherence once the patient assistance program was started? So we talked about a lot of different studies, so let's kind of wrap it all up with another knowledge check. JT is a 55-year-old female with diabetes and hypertension. And her PCP recently added exenatide 5 micrograms twice daily to her regimen of citagliptin and metformin. Based on the available literature that we saw, what outcome would you expect of this dual incretin therapy? Do you think A, necrotizing pancreatitis, B, 15 pound weight loss, C, A1C reduction between 0.6 to 0.8 percent, or D, no effect on A1C? All right, and while that poll goes, I did see a question here from Dr. Jane about the patient we just talked about. Did she change her physical activity? And you know, that's a really good question because um, when I read through the case, it actually didn't mention it at all. So that very well could have been a big contribution to her A1C reduction that we saw. All right, so moving back over to this poll, what I see is that most of you guys are thinking C is the answer, an A1C reduction between 0.6 and 0.8%. And at the end of the, way, the day, um, this is the best answer, but you all could be right, because we did see that there's two case reports that showed necrotizing pancreatitis and weight loss respectively. But it's also possible that in clinical practice, we've started patients on these agents and didn't really see much of an effect on A1C due to non-adherence. Um, so here, the reason why C is the best answer is because our strongest forms of evidence point over to this um, particular A1C reduction with dual incretin therapy. So what do you guys think? Should we be treating our patients with type 2 diabetes with dual incretin therapy? I went ahead and listed out some of the pros and cons so we could think about it. Well, 
An A1C reduction of 0.68% is a good thing. We wouldn't really want to turn that down. And for some patients, that's all that they need to get to their goal. Generally, the combination is well tolerated. So um, while both agents are associated with the risk of pancreatitis, there is no evidence that together <clears throat> that risk is uh, compounded. We also see that there's the strongest evidence exists for using these agents together whenever you're using a short-acting GLP-1 agonist like exenatide or lixisenatide. Moving over to the cons though, again, that pancreatitis thing is a question that we don't have the answer to. So that's just something to be aware of. With the A1C lowering less than synergistic when using these two incretin agents, it's possible that you'd get a better bang for your buck using two agents with differing mechanisms of action. And lastly, we unfortunately didn't see any benefits shown with long-acting GLP-1 agonists as shown in the Lathia case series, where really the A1C lowering looked like it was all due to the GLP-1 agonist at 0.8%. So moving back on to Mario, if you remember, he's our 40-year-old male who loves pineapple pizza and is sitting down a lot more often and now has an A1C of 8.1%. So you talked with Mario and talked about uh, starting liraglutide to help with his diabetes. And he thought, hey, this might help with my weird food cravings too. So he's willing to try it. So based on available literature, what would you like to do with his citagliptin metformin therapy? Would you like to A, keep it, B, stop it, C, start metformin alone, or D, both B and C? So I've got a bit of a split room. I've got some people who want to keep the citagliptin metformin, and I've got um, other people who want to stop it. So um, can somebody who votes to continue the citagliptin metformin tell me why you would want to continue it? Any brave souls out there? Nobody. All right. Well, I mean, thinking about kind of what all we talked about, I can see a reason for wanting to continue the citagliptin metformin in the sense that it probably won't hurt Mario to keep it on board. Um, but at the same time, I can also, uh, you know, personally, I would have went with D, B, and C because I'd rather let Mario save some of his gold coins by just switching him over to one expensive medication and stopping the other potentially expensive medication, especially since our evidence is showing that there really isn't much benefit with using DPP-4 inhibitors with GLP-1 agonists together. We do have a couple of comments in the chat box. Do you want me to read those for you? Sure thing. It says, what is the evidence for increasing physical activity to 150 minutes per week from a sedentary lifestyle in A1C? So generally speaking, um, physical activity is recommended in our patients with diabetes to help them to lose weight um, and has also been shown to help um, with their blood sugars and lowering of A1C. But to be completely honest with you, I'm not sure of the exact reductions that you would see if a patient started to exercise. There was one more comment here. It says, it seems that the evidence states that it has a possible benefit needs to be cost benefit talk. Yep, that's fair enough. So um, with the Violante and colleagues study, we did see with the short acting that there was a teeny bit of A1C lowering that was added whenever you use the agents together. Um, so I, I think that that's reasonable too, to have a cost benefit talk. So for a patient who doesn't have co-pays for both agents, it might be easier to just add the liraglutide right on top of it. And you can be pretty confident that it's not going to cause additional harm to a patient. However, if the patient has $47 co-pays with the 
the Janumet, as well as a $47 copay with Victoza, in that case, there's even more of a compelling reason to go ahead and stop the Janumet at that point. So this is just to wrap up everything we talked about today. Thank you guys so much for uh, your participation and your questions throughout. But just to wrap things up, patients with diabetes do have a blunted response to their incretin hormones, which does contribute to reduced glucose dependent insulin release and hyperglycemia. Generally speaking, when we look at our clinical guidelines, GLP-1 agonists are preferred over DPP-4 inhibitors. And after review of the limited literature that we do have on dual incretin therapy, the suggestion here is that the combination is likely safe, but not likely synergistic. I've got a bunch of references here. And I'd like to go ahead and open the floor to any other questions that you may have. Okay, and I see a comment here in the chat from Dr. Davidson saying at least 0.5% lowering with physical activity, certainly more depending on weight loss and severity of insulin resistance, upwards of 1% to 2%. Um, so that was to ask, answer the previous question about um, the evidence for increasing physical activity um, for patients with a sed sedentary lifestyle. So that's actually pretty good. That's like adding a whole medication if the patient's down to exercise. Thank you all for the comments. It was a pleasure sharing this with you guys today. Do we have any other questions or comments? Feel free to unmute. Well, I think with that, we'll go ahead and end the presentation for today. I did put the evaluation link in the chat box, if you could please help us out. And I want to thank you, Dr. Torres, for an excellent presentation. And I want to thank everybody as well for joining us today. All right. Thank you, everybody. This was fun. Hopefully, I got to teach you guys something. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.